All right, good morning, everyone. It's always a joy to share God's Word uh, here at Grace Point North, because number one, uh, you know, even though you guys have your own church now, you have your own pastor, you have your own elders, there's something about family, right, that even though you separate and you start another family, uh, when you worship, come back together, you still have that feeling of family all the time. And so what a joy it is to preach and to worship together like this. And number two, it's a joy because it reminds us that we're on the same team, right? That we're all brothers and sisters fighting for the same cause with the same purpose. And so what a joy it is to look at at all your faces and to be reminded that we can share our resources, help one another, support each other for God's kingdom cause. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, even though we kind of read it during uh, today's uh, call to worship. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to read from 8 to 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Okay, this is the reading of God's Word. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field and keeping watch over their flock. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with a great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling swaddling cloths, and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. This is the word of God, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You know, I don't know what your Christmas uh, get togethers are like, but for my family, uh, since it's been growing exponentially, it's been getting crazier and crazier. And I say this because when I was a kid, we had my mom has, I think, like five brothers and sisters. And so all six, and they, each of them had their own kids, you know, all my cousins. And so it was even crazy back then. But now almost all my cousins are like me. They all have their own children, like two or three that are now like almost 10 years old each. And so you can imagine we exponentially grew. And it's a house full of 40 to 50 people. It's crazy. We, we could almost start our own church, right? <laughs> and so these days when we meet, the craziest part, though, is that each year, every uncle and aunt, every cousin, too, they buy a gift for each single kid in our family. And what's e- cr- crazy is that one by one, we'll call them up. We'll say, Barnabas, come up. This is from un- Uncle Jonah, right? And so we all watch him open the present. And we all watch him thank, go, and hug the uncle. And we, they take a picture for every single gift. It literally takes hours and hours. What a blessing it is to have so many gifts, but it takes so long. But the one thing I have to say is, even though it's a crazy time and it takes so much time, the thing I appreciate about this time is, instead of wreaking havoc and everyone opening gifts at one time, we're trying to teach them. Even though you're excited about these gifts, it's more than just a gift, right? That this moment is about the gift giver. Their love for you. Do you know how much time they had to put in to go shopping? To click that button on Amazon, (laughs) right? How much time, how much money, how much sacrifice it takes. And so it's more about the experience of receiving the gift than the gift itself. That's what we're trying to teach them. And, of course, they're like, okay, okay, can we open the next gift, right? And they don't really have to understand sometimes, and they can be sad. But the reason I share this, um, the one thing at Grace Point, Maine, we've been doing, if we can show the next image, is that we've been looking at various theophanies during this Advent season. And if you don't know what a theophany is, it's the appearance of God, right? And that each theophany, it shows and teaches us a, a critical, um, critical thing about God's character and who he is. And so as we come to Luke chapter 2, in the first Christmas ever, what I'd like us to see is this is, 
God's ultimate theophany. And that it's more than God giving us a gift, saying, here's my baby Jesus as a present. It's more than the gift itself. It's teaching us about God, about his love, who he is. And if we can show the next slide, the two main things of God's character that I want us to see in our passage, that this is teaching us about God's grace, and it's teaching us about God's peace. And so first, as we look at the coming of Jesus in the form of a baby, I'd like us to see how it teaches us about God's grace. Um, I forget if it was this year or last year, and if you can show the next slide too, there's a picture of you know, our team, Grace Point and Grace Point North. We go to Atlantic City every year, right? And when we go, the pastors and the leaders of this church, they always lead a seminar about how to minister to the homeless, how to minister to the needy. And during the Q&A, one of the questions came up, how do we wisely help and give to the homeless without enabling their addictions, without giving them just money to feed their addictions? Like, we want to help them, but if we give them $100, how do we know they're not going to just take that and buy drugs, right? And so after a lot of discussion, there's, there wasn't a simple answer because it's a, you know, a, a pretty complex question. But one suggestion that was offer, offered was, rather than giving cash, why not help provide for their needs, right? Why not buy them, like, a meal? And so we can say, you need money for food, so let me buy you food rather than giving you money. That way you can spend time with them, you can talk to them, and things like that. Of course, during our off day, we're walking around Atlantic City on one of our rest days. And of course, after going through this, a homeless woman comes up to our group and she asks for some money. And so at that point, I'm, I'm not going to lie, as someone that grew up close to New York, I was always grow, uh, taught growing up, protect yourself, right? Protect your money, make sure no one steals, pickpockets you or anything like that. And so when people come up to me, I just want to ignore them and just move on. But, of course, after this seminar, after when I bring my kids and they're looking at me, how are you going to respond, right? At that moment, I told Tay to take the group ahead, and I take this homeless woman to McDonald's. We walk to McDonald's, and the thing is, when we get there, the woman was like, can I wait outside? And the reason why I want to wait outside is because I'm never welcome there. Every time I go there, the workers kick me out. And when she shared that with me, you know, we think McDonald's, what, it's no big deal. Anyone can go, right? Any of us in this room, if we felt like eating McDonald's, we can go. But it's not true. Not everyone is in welcome at McDonald's. If you're homeless, you're not very welcome. If you don't have any money, you're not welcome. If you look unkempt and you just look like this crazy person, you're going to get kicked out for just loitering. And so when she told me her story, it broke my heart. And so I grabbed her hand and I said, no, we're going inside. And if anyone has anything to say to you, you tell them you're my guest and we're going to go together. And I share this story with you because when, I, when we think about Christmas, we probably think about shopping and gifts, right? We think about lights. We think about beautiful decorations like this tree, the trees around us. We think about yummy foods. What are we going to make for our family? We think about fun. We think about people. We think about music, right? Baby, it's cold outside, right? That's one of my favorite Christmas songs. I love it. And yet the truth is, you know what Christmas is really about? It's about God's grace. And his grace to the broken, to those who are spiritually homeless, to those who are spiritually hungry. And we know this because if we can show the next clip, you know, out of all the people in the world that God is going to show himself to first, it wasn't kings, it wasn't governors of the world. It's not the rich, it's not the successful, it's not even the pastors or the priests. But if you look in scripture, it says God showed himself to shepherds. And we might think, no big deal again, right? Because we always read this in the Bible about shepherds. But the thing about shepherds we need to understand is, even though we know guys like Abraham, Moses, David, these guys are decent guys, so it must be a decent job, right? But to be a shepherd was a very lowly job. It was for the outcasts. 
It was for the unclean, the people with bad reputations, because they were out in the field working, and they couldn't keep many of the ceremonial laws. And so it was for the dirty, it was for the unclean. And what commentators go as far as to say is that they were as bad as liars and as thieves. And whenever there was a court case, their testimony was never admissible because they said, you're just as bad as liars and thieves. Why should we trust these shepherds? Another thing what I'd like to point out about why Christmas is for the broken, not only because it's for the shepherds, but we know it's for the broken because if you look in our passage, it's for people who's terrified of the light, but oddly like the dark. They're scared. They're filled with a great fear, it says, right? They're scared of the light, but they like the darkness. And this is crazy if you think about it. Even from children, we know it's natural to be afraid of the dark, right? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I still get scared of the dark. When it's pitch black and I can't see anything, there's something about that that makes me a little bit scared. And yet in our text, in verse 8, the shepherds are calm in the dark. And yet verse 9, it says, when the light of God shines down on them, they're completely terrified. Why is that? Why do they like the dark, but they're afraid of the light? And if we think about it, I think you and I know exactly why this is. As sinners, when we do something wrong, it's scary, right, to be exposed and to be in the light. We're much more comfortable when we're in the dark, when no one knows about our sins. Imagine what do we post on Facebook for everyone to see? Our family, the fun times, going to Disney World, doing this and that, all the good things. But what if, what if some of the dark things that we've done that nobody knows about, it was posted? How scared we would be, how much fear that we would have. And that's why, what's Vegas' tagline? What's their number one way to get people to come to Vegas? What happens at Vegas stays in Vegas, right? And we like that, don't we? Because, again, it's comforting when we can sin in dark with no one knowing and yet be terrified if it was ever brought in the light, if anyone ever found out. And so what's crazy to see in our passage is knowing, again, knowing that these shepherds are despicable, that God goes to them first, and B, knowing that these guys are des deceitful sinners, the angels say to them, even though I know you're hiding things, even though I know you're a sinner, don't be afraid. You have nothing to worry about or be afraid around a holy and awesome God. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Why shouldn't I be afraid when I know I did something wrong and I'm in the presence of a holy God? And the reason why is because God is coming to reveal himself that God is a God of grace. We don't have to be well-polished, brothers and sisters. We don't have to be ashamed of our failures, of our history. We don't have to be ashamed of our family situation or our marriages. We don't have to be afraid of hiding any sort of sin. And that's the joy of Christmas. That's what Christmas is pointing to. That God is coming, not because of who we are, not because we are these perfect people, not because we are these spiritual homeless, uh, homeless and spiritually hungry people, but God is coming to reveal himself because he is a God of grace. That's the good news. The second thing I'd like us to see is that Jesus came, and this theophany, the ultimate theophany we're looking at, is not to only show that God is a God of grace, but God is a God of peace. And this is important because if you think about it, it's really hard, isn't it? And I would say almost impossible to get over your fears, to get over your insecurities without God, isn't it? Perhaps we can try some uh, psychotherapy where we can gradually expose ourselves to fear. And then maybe our emotions won't overcome us, but we can control our emotions, right? Maybe we can use medication we can use some beta blockers to block the different ways our bodies react to situations. 
use different sedatives to relax us. Then it will answer our fear, will it not? Or maybe we just need money. Money will pay for our therapy. It will pay for medications. It will pay for us to go on vacations and to places that we want to go. That seemed to help the homeless lady get over her fear, fear of going to McDonald's if we just had money to go inside. But you know what? As much as these things are good things, I'm not saying that therapy is bad. I'm not saying medication is bad. And there's nothing wrong with going on vacations either. But still, if you look at this next quote here, even though these things can be good things, one philosopher put it this way, talking about Caesar Augustus. This philosopher said, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, from grief, and from envy. He cannot give peace of the heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. In other words, the world can offer us physical peace, and perhaps it could even offer us mental peace, right? But what this quote is saying is we'll never find true peace and rest for our souls. That's what he's saying here. And that's what Christmas is about too. Because if we look at our passage, if you can bring up the passage up, which is next again, we know the passage says, fear not. Why fear not? Because behold, I bring good news to you of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born in the day of the city of uh, David a Savior. A Savior has come. That's why we don't have to be afraid. A Savior from being an outcast. A Savior from being exposed of all of our things in the light. A Savior from all of our fears. And so the big question we have to ask is, how is this baby going to save us? How is this baby going to save us? Is it going to be through therapy? Is it going to be through medication? Or perhaps bringing us to Disney World? How is this baby going to save us from all our fears? And I think this, is a, this was probably a little bit harder for the shepherds to understand. Because again, if you, you haven't been looking at the theophanies of God Almost all of them in the Old Testament, they're of power, they're of fire, they're of thunder. All the theophanies are like this. And so I'm sure the Israelites assume the Savior that's going to come, it's going to be this powerful man that's going to overthrow Rome, that's going to bring power and peace for the Israelites to rule the day. I'm sure that's what they thought. But this wouldn't be so. Because if you look in our passage, again, it says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in the manger. You see, the ultimate appearance of God is in the form of a baby. And it wouldn't be any baby either. It would be the lowliest one. Most babies, when we celebrate, and a lot of, we have a lot of young families, when most babies are born, we celebrate it, and we, we welcome that baby. But when the king of the universe enters the world, he's almost completely ignored. Born in a manger, he was born in poverty. How humiliating. And yet the Bible tells us it's this humility that is a sign of godliness. This humility that is a sign of the gospel. This humility was a sign that Jesus was God. And if we turn to the very end of Luke, and if we can go to the next slide, you know what else the Bible tells us? That this baby will grow to be a man. And basically we learn that this baby was born on Christmas Day only to humbly die the death of a criminal on a cross. And when he was crucified, you know what happened? You know what scripture says if you look up here? In the middle of the day, all of a sudden, everything goes completely dark. And people must have been wondering, what in the world is going on? Why is, imagine it being daytime and all of a sudden it becomes pitch black. What's going on? Is there an eclipse going on or something? But no, we know it wasn't an eclipse. 
And even though they were probably confused, we know better, don't we? It went dark because on the cross, our Savior was dying. He was taking our chaos. He was taking our identity as sinners. He was taking our penalty as people who love the dark. And at the same time, he was trading us eternal peace. He says, I'll take your chaos, you take my peace. I'll take your identity as sinners, you take my identity as children of God, children of light. Friends, this is the good news for Christmas this morning. And so what does all of this mean, that God is a God of peace, that God is a God of grace? You know, let me end with this. As I came across, uh, as I was studying this passage, I came across one reading about this missionary who struggled with trying to translate this passage, actually, the passage that we read. Because in this other language for this other uh, native people, that they had no word for peace in their language. And so with the help of some natives, if we can look at this last slide here, this is the best that they came up with. God in heaven is just so good, so the people who live in the world, if God's heart is happy with them, then their fear is all gone now. That was the best that they can come up with. Then their fear is all gone now. Brothers and sisters, this is the major takeaway of our passage. This is what Christmas is really about. Jesus' birth means no fear but peace. No longer do we have to be ashamed of what people think about us. No longer do we have to be afraid of the skeletons that we have in our closet. No longer do we have to worry about the problems we had in 2019 and what may follow us in 2020. We don't have to be afraid of any of these things. But if we understand that God came to provide grace and peace, like the shepherds, instead of being afraid, it will compel us, church. It will compel us to sing for joy and to have a heart of worship this Christmas morning as we celebrate with friends and family. Amen? All right, let's pray together.